Hello and welcome to another episode of the Master Mind, Body, and Spirit Show. I am your host, Matt Belair, and today's guest is a skin cancer surgeon, family physician, academic, skin care expert, evolutionary biologist, storyteller, and social entrepreneur, as well as an adjunct professor at Auckland University of Technology. Born in England with a childhood in India, he is a global citizen who lives down under. In 2008, he was featured in international editions of Time and in 2015 was awarded the prestigious Ko Awatia International Excellence Award for leading health improvement on a global scale. He is the author of the new book, The Genetics of Health, Understand Your Genes for Better Health. Welcome to the show, Dr. Sherrod Paul. What's up, brother? How are you? Very good. Man, so it's really nice to meet you. Um, we we're, were talking very briefly before about uh, living in uh, New Zealand. I spent some time there uh, as a snowboarder. Uh, your time there as a doctor is a little bit, um, little bit different. But when I got introduced to your work, you are doing a lot of things, as you can tell in the bio. Uh, your background is very professional. It's very diverse. It's very experienced. Do you want to give the audience a little bit of background on how you're able to do all that stuff, a, a brief history, and then we can dive into wherever you want to go, a little bit about the book that, you're, that you've are that you written, that you're promoting, um, and, and all the amazing things that you're up to? I think fundamentally, I would like to think of myself as a creative. So you're really, um, when you said the storyteller part, I think fundamentally that comes with being creative and trying to solve problems and as you know as opposed to learning by factual knowledge if we just try i teach creativity at both at the university and also one day a week to children who can't read and write properly so what it means is i guess in my main medical work i'm a skin cancer um, surgeon and i guess how i came to this book was really when we're looking at illness the first thing we test people these days is their genes to see will they respond to a particular medication or not? And I was thinking, if we were doing this for illness, how can we don't do it for wellness? And so I started looking at the genes behind, you know, happiness and procrastination and laziness and coffee and vitamin C and various things. And hence, really, the book is basically about how we can learn to eat and exercise for our gene types. But it also showed me that genes are... We can look at genes as our blueprint, but they're not our destiny. So really, everything is in our own control as to how we can shape our mind and body. Amazing, interesting. Um, I'm I'm trying to remember the uh, the book I I read. It was really interesting. It was, uh, it was something about uh, genes and uh, uh, oh, gene keys. Have you ever heard about that book? Gene Keys? No, I haven't. Okay, yeah, it was just very, very fascinating because uh, it would just speak about, you know, the genes that you have, and it would it would uh, give you enough information to basically make a choice, kind of similar to to saying what what you're saying is that it's not like a a curse or a gift. It's just something that is a little bit uh, more prone to to having. Uh, what about Dr. Bruce Lint Lipton's work with? Uh, um, um, you know, Dr. The Bruce of belief. Yeah, I, I know Bruce only because he actually, you may know, he actually lives half the year here, right here in Auckland. And he actually oh, has I didn't a know place that. on the, yeah, yeah. He actually does spend half the year in Kerry Kerry, which is not maybe about 40 minutes from where I am right now. So I know Bruce and Margaret quite well. But amazing. Um, so basically, I guess his work is slightly different in the sense that he's talking about how our cells respond to the environment. And what I'm talking about is we all are born with a set of genes and genes are fundamentally just makers of proteins. So different things you do in your actions and lifestyle cause different gene expressions, so good or bad. So it is within our control to take charge. And secondly, uh, I guess where the link is with what he's saying is that the environment matters because the external environment affects our genes, as does our internal environment, which is our diet and exercise and lifestyle. So in some ways, 
we can control our internal environment to help our genes. And what he's talking about is if we don't control our external environment, we, we're we not so attuned to the environment that all these things affect our biology. And just like fact, we know that some people genetically um, have are naturally more likely to believe in certain things and some people are naturally more likely to be skeptical and for some people are more likely to respond to acupuncture or homeopathy or body work than others and we know there is a genetic thing for it and those are the sort of things he says you know there is biology in belief okay perfect yeah that's you know because my understanding honestly about this stuff is very limited um you know i do subscribe and hope to the idea that we can affect our reality you know a lot of people out there will one of the simple ones they'll say you know when they start to get sick they start to identify with you know i am now getting sick and then they're sick for the two-week cycle and um, from what i can deduce in your work you're you're saying that we have a choice in creating a healthy um, experience in our lives even if our genes are not set up to win so to speak um, can you speak a little bit about how we can you know uncover this information figure out what our gene type is and then how to live a healthier lifestyle and maybe some of the common uh, problems that you see with people just maybe creating disease within their lives and they could easily um, you know have an awareness or understanding and, and stop that I think fundamentally, before uh, we're going to specific, some of the book is basically about general things which we all can do as being living more authentic. What it really means is also being more natural. So it comes with, as a general rule, most foods which have more chemicals, which are less natural, produce wrong kinds of proteins, which actually seems pretty intuitive, but we still, uh, you know, we still seem to need some education there. So. And on the other hand, it's the same thing with everything else, I guess, even our minds, you know, it's easy for us to become processed people because we are told what to do or monitor or this or that, rather than trying to open our own eyes and figure out things for ourselves. I guess, but from a specific point of view, I have actually, as part of the book, if you read the book at the end of it, you can actually go to my website, which is just sharadpaul.com, and you can actually order a gene test anywhere in the world and we'll send you a kit out and it, it specifically like i said we don't test for illness it's purely for wellness for diet and exercise but let me give you one example which probably will indicate why this may be useful um, so for example one in five people carry a particular um, gene um, a non-functioning variant of uh, vitamin C gene. So if you think about vitamin C, everybody knows it's in citrus fruits and it's good for you. And from an evolutionary point of view, there is a use it or lose it thing. So in other words, we know that creatures who eat a lot of vitamin C, um, like bats and gorillas and humans, don't can't produce it anymore. Whereas creatures which never ate the citrus fruits because they hate the damn things actually uh, can produce their own vitamin C. So now, interestingly, some of us um, cannot metabolize vitamin C properly, and that's about 20% of the population. And these were studies done, actually, funnily, this study came out of Canada, and it was also then replicated in Asia. And they basically looked at young people in their 20s and 30s, and what they found is, if you have a non-functioning variant of this vitamin C gene, then each year your waist circ circumference went up by a little half an inch your blood sugar went up by one point your blood pressure went up so by the time you were middle-aged these people had either borderline diabetes or diabetes or heart disease or kidney disease and all this could have prevented by just doubling your vitamin c intake by not taking any pills but all you needed to do is eat an extra orange a day or eat an extra capsicum a day so what it means is if you knew this medicine will only typically pick you up once you reach that stage and you've got the disease and then the idea is to give you some medication but here what you do is you can prevent it by taking charge of your own health and it's not really about selling you anything beyond it because you don't need as we know most supplements will really just get excreted because they are again manufactured forms so really if you can eat them in the more natural form it's even better for you so so that's a simple example but what it means is by just that one gene test out of the 21 that we do it means that you will know should you be the one who is consuming more of that to reduce your risk because sometimes when you're 
overweight and you're trying everything else and you can't lose weight, you wouldn't figure out that it's this what's causing all that. So, you know, you may be trying all the diets and you may be thinking, I just can't get this weight off, but it may be as simple as just modifying what you eat. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, what it's kind of making me think about is like uh, just a standard that might be in the future. So maybe five or 10 years from now, we all have access to this information. Um, so yeah. then we can make better life decisions. Like sometimes people are, are uh, celiac or they um, or need to go gluten free or whatever, and they can't figure out why they're tired or, or why they're holding water weight or whatever the case is. But if we had this uh, information, we can make better decisions and, and live a healthier lifestyle. Is is this gene technology something new? And and in your opinion, how important is it for somebody to figure this out, learn the information, so they can move forward with uh, understanding their their bodies a little bit better? Yeah, and, and that's why actually the book was called Understanding Your Genes for Better Health. And it's really not about medicine, but health. And um, one, you're right. I mean, in my, I totally agree. And in fact, I say this in the book that in my view, this will be the norm in say 10 years and then 20 years, I think this will be everywhere because I don't think no healthcare system, whether it's an NHS based model like in Canada or New Zealand or Britain or a totally private one like in the US can afford to cover all the costs of uh, diseases. And I think longer term, this is really the way to go. But at the moment, because there's more money in illness, not in wellness, right? So unless people take charge of it. So, so one of the things, like you said earlier, I've done a lot of things in life. And one of them was that after I studied medicine, I actually did law, even though I never practiced as a lawyer. But what I found was that Medicine law was similar in being old fashioned gills, so there are a lot of rules and regulations. And one of the things I often say, and I've mentioned this in the book, is law doesn't translate into justice because, you know, sometimes you may say, hey, this guy obviously stabbed somebody, but he, he wasn't read his rights properly and he gets away. And then people would say, that's not justice. So law isn't justice, just like medicine isn't health. So to get health, you need to take some personal responsibility. And I think part of this is you saying, I'm going to take personal responsibility for my body, my mind, my health. And so that's part of understanding all this. So so I think, yeah, I'm just seeing it a bit ahead of the curve. So, so again, to explain this further, there are three different types of gene testing which is available right now. So the most common one you'll come across in America, you'll see them advertised in you know, 23 and many companies. Those are things which we call whole genome sequencing or WGS. And that's basically people testing your entire gene profile. Now, there are some issues with that because largely you test for a lot of diseases which you can't do anything about. So in my view, stress is such a big part of our lives that and actually, if you think that you're going to get some form of dementia, which there's no treatment for, I think the stress will kill you anyway, if you reach. So I think you've got to be a bit careful. And the second thing is, it has also has implications in our world for insurance and things like that, because a lot of these companies also can sell your information on. The second type of thing is the microbiota, which is where they're testing your feces to see for gluten and lactose. The problem is, is not entirely accurate. So what I've developed is basically a 21 gene panel. It does include like gluten and lactose, like you said, a whole panel of vitamins, your fats and your sugars and your also exercise. Some people are more prone to power exercises, which means, you know, it's better to have a little bit of weight training for you. Some people are more tuned to endurance. So I always joke, and if you were in New Zealand, you would have noted that rugby is a religion here you know rugby the, the game in you know, new zealand is like crazy about rugby i suppose it's like canada and hockey right it's completely crazy so with joke with this gene test that when all the kids are the same age or level we can actually pick who are have got the power gene so effectively like in a scrum you can pick who's going to be the grunt up front so i think you know the thing is you can actually use it to personalize your own exercise, personalize your own diet. And, and also what it does is, like you said, more importantly, it makes you more energetic. It optimizes your performance. You know, you start being able to do more things. You're more positive. So I really think it's all part of just taking charge. 
Awesome. Yeah. Well, I definitely love your point of view and uh, your notes on on um, taking responsibility for our own health, because I think that we're just conditioned to every time something is goes wrong, we can just go grab a pill and that's going to fix it rather than looking at the root of the problem, which might be lack of exercise, too much drinking, uh, eating Kentucky fried chicken every single day. You know, that that is the issue. And and really, we do have a lot of money in illness you know that's that's just the truth of it there is uh i think you know i don't know if the movie's about this but i saw a cure for wellness and i just thought about it as like a documentary like you know how how um you know there's so much money in medicine and um what you're really sharing here is really powerful because even if step one we just take responsibility for our health you know look at our diets and look at our exercise you know, right there, we're going to be dodging most issues. Um, then we can bring modern. Uh, totally, I agree. And I think, you know, let's just look at simple example. So, for example, I was looking at, say, if you take sodas like Pepsi or Coke, for example, with high sugar content, I was just looking at it broadly as to why is, you know, we all know that sugar is not very good for us. And I was looking at why do we need so much sugar in them? And I found something interesting is, and this was when I was studying the caffeine genes, right? So some of us have a gene, 50% of the population are fast metabolizers of caffeine and 50% are slow. So if you're a fast metabolizer, then actually coffee is pretty good for you. But if you're a slow metabolizer, then coffee can increase your risk of heart disease, right? So, but what I was looking at is these drinks are caffeinated. And what I found is caffeine actually dulls, and you'll find this very interesting, is caffeine dulls our taste receptors for sweetness specifically. It kills them temporarily. So what I mean is if you put caffeine on your tongue, you can't taste the sweetness. So you have to add a lot more sugar for you to be able to taste it. Now, here's what's interesting. So then you would think, so if you're making this kind of a fizzy drinks, you have to add so much sugar before you taste it if it's caffeinated. And as you know, all these, many of these drinks are caffeinated. And then you would think, why would you need so much sugar? And here's what's interesting. I mean, it sounds like a conspiracy theory, but it's probably not. It's maybe just smart marketing. But what it is, is till you hit that level of sugar, you won't get addicted to it. So if you were just consuming a little bit of sugar, then it doesn't target your opiate receptors. So coffee, for example, binds to adenosine, which is a different receptor in the brain, which is related to dop dopamine. But sugar binds to your opiate receptors, especially at very high doses. So these fizzy drinks, they need such a high level of sugar because they have caffeine. Otherwise, you can't taste the sugar that you actually get addicted to them. So in some ways, you can come off co um, coffee in 7 to 12 days cold turkey. But to come off an addiction, if you were drinking Coke or Pepsi every day or fizzy drinks with caffeine, Red Bull, whatever, it will take you like two months and you will get the shakes and you would be like you're withdrawing from uh, heroin or something like that. So so it is quite, fat, you know, it's interesting from an industry point of view, we put so many chemicals into it to do specific actions. But then look at the counterpoint is studies were done. And like you said, when you mentioned KFC, the studies were done basically on fast food and fizzy drinks. And actually they fed this to mice and small doses and they call this the American cafeteria diet here. Yeah? And so they put these uh, mice on. And what it did is not only did these mice um, gain weight, obviously because of sugar, but what was interesting is they got low mood and they were angry or they were stressed and they not, had no energy. So what was interesting is that it was a vicious cycle in the mood and changes and productivity and everything else. So it almost like was a vicious cycle. So as you know, in society becoming increasingly unequal, the sad point is that if you are then at the bottom end of society and all the food you can afford is the junk food, then it's a vicious cycle because not only it's going to make you overweight, it's going to make you lazier, it's going to make you more stressed, depressed, angry. So it just becomes a vicious cycle you can't get out of. So really we have to find a way. And one of the things I'm doing now with these, I work with these schools, one day a week really teaching creative writing, but I'm trying to once a month work with the parents and teach them about healthy eating and how you can, you know, that health, eating healthy doesn't have to be expensive, but how you can just be with less chemicals, more natural. 
Yeah, yeah, man, totally agree. That's well, very important stuff. That my sorry, my mind is going. I was ready to ask about five different questions at once. Yeah. Um, you know, I know for sure that that sugar is a huge issue. You know, the, the like when I started to eat clean, it was a whole process for me. So if you watch any documentary like What the Health or Food Inc. or and you start to look at um, what is in your food. That is that is number one. It's it's so much chemical and poison, and 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 probably the root of most illness in people. And we're not taught how to eat, and it's getting more inexpensive to get artificial food, and way more expensive to uh, get food that is healthy, that is natural, that there's no chemicals on it, um, and it's definitely affecting every part of our lives. And you know, my girlfriend's a kindergarten teacher and, you know, she'll see in the lower income, sometimes the kids just get a bag of chips and a pop for, uh, for their lunch. And then that's the kid who usually has the most amount of problems, which makes perfect sense. Um, so I guess I wanted to go back and then move forward because I, ha I have uh, a few questions. One of them is with the genes, um, what would that process look like? Let's say myself, uh, someone's in the United States, Canada, Europe, or whatever the case is. Um, what would the process look like to map out our genes and then how do we get that information? Is it through the book? And then once I know my gene code, I can look at the book and then I can have a guide for how I can adapt my diet and, and be mindful of, of what I'm more prone to. Um, they both independent, but linked. So basically the book summarizes how our past history of humanity shapes our genes and why. See, for example, one thing we must think about is human beings came out of Africa 100,000 years ago and migrated all over. So those days we didn't have travel. And if you think about air travel, it's this last century. And if you think about motor vehicles, we were talking about, again, the last two centuries. So it's really mobility among humans has been very limited. So diets evolved in different parts of the world where they could grow certain things. So genetically a lot of people so if you look at it broadly take one step back and look at it asia they were more hunter gatherers so they have a higher incidence of lactose intolerance and middle east is where dairy farming came about and then went into europe so there's very little lactose intolerance in those areas now in the for example if you take populations like india between south and north there's a difference in north they're wheat eaters and south they're rice eaters so typically um, you'd find very little gluten intolerance where people ate wheat. So, so fundamentally, a lot of these things shaped our genes. But now what's interesting is that diets have become very homogenized. So, you know, you go wherever you're in Canada or New Zealand or Africa or Asia, you can get Indian food or Thai food or Italian food, whatever. So, so therefore, we're all eating the same kind of stuff and we're all eating the same kind of fast food as well but we're not necessarily suited for it. So I guess the book links back to these evolutionary past, but also talks about how we can shape it. Now, how does this gene test look like is linked. So the way it's done is also independent in the sense that if you didn't read the book and you got the gene test, I actually give you a very detailed report. So how it looks like is you're in Canada and you order the test. We send you a kit out to you and in which you collect a saliva sample and you mail it back. To the, we have some collection centers all over. So in Europe, we have in London, we have one in Canada, one in US, and Australia, New Zealand, we're sent to Australia. So we have labs everywhere, Singapore. So what happens is we have I've sort of partnered with some labs who can do the initial processing. So what we do is we take your sample. So we've identified these 21 genes. Um, they're listed on my website. But fundamentally, it's all about eating and exercising for your gene type and also looking at any specific intolerances like, you know, gluten or lactose or starch, things like that. So then you get a personalized report and it's very personalized to you. So for example, yours may say, you know, Matt, you've got this gene for, you're a slow metabolizer of coffee, therefore you can have up to 200 milligrams of caffeine a day quite safely. And then it will break it down even, they will even tell you that if one shot of espresso is 80 milligrams, so two is 150. So if you're a double shot drinker, you can only have one a day. Plunge your coffee as 130, how much does decaf have? So it's really, really personalized to the degree that you can actually uh, eat for your gene type. So you didn't, if you did that, you 
you'd probably read the book because you'd find the whole linkage between your past and all that fascinating uh, and also the other theories which wouldn't be in the test if you did you wouldn't know that just eating coke could or drinking coke could do so much damage or how it affects our mind or the fact that like for example i was when i was researching the ability of the caffeine gene to knock out our um, sweet receptors what we found is humans and the hummingbirds are one of the only two creatures which can taste different types of sweetness and now here's what's interesting in a hummingbird you give them an artificial sweetener and it spits it out as if it's a poison but in humans we still take an artificial sweetener and we think it's sweet because it's manufactured to target the same opiate receptor so we're not as smart as hummingbirds so so one of the things if you think about is you know the biggest danger i think likewise is our external environment which we don't pay enough attention to so if you can medicine going forwards you know our biggest danger is you know any other creature it's like i was saying to somebody recently if you put crocodiles in an overpopulated area and uh, this was done in a crocodile bank in india and australia has got a lot of crocodiles as well and what you find is the female starts burying their eggs at a different level or depth in the soil so the temperature is different and so they produce more males as the population comes down so most animals know that they cannot just pillage all the food around them and expect to survive so they're always mindful that we've got to live here let's just look after our environment but in humans we've lost that intuitiveness so we have began to behave like we own the place without realizing that human beings have only been around for 100,000 years and in modern civilization is 2,000 years earth has been here for billions of years and and then you see the leading scientists of the world the best thing everybody is now coming up with is it's going to become uninhabitable so let's look at mars but that was not natural for us so i really think you know those sort of things both with eating natural and living natural around us whereas if you go and talk to silicon valley and i've been there everybody is fascinated with longevity and living longer but everybody is wanting a pill which they can they can we need to be on our computers all day so let's just have a pill in the morning which has got all the enzymes and all the vitamins we need what kind of a life is it you know so i think we have to strike a balance between being authentic and using modern technology for our convenience not for enslavement but at the moment we're using technology more to as a form of slavery because we all get tied to it we all have to work longer we can't get away from them but not to empower us you know and and i really think the only way forward is we have to have more knowledge about our environment be more in tune with it and so really if we don't protect our external environment we're finished in this planet anyway but the planet's going to be there beyond us there're going to be many other creatures still there but we're not as adaptable and the second thing is likewise our internal environment with our food if we continue eating or abusing our bodies the way we're doing then you're going to have this into ill health i mean if you look back and you think okay a lot of things have advanced we live longer than before most of these advances are not because of medicine but because of things like sanitation cleaner water a lot of those but those are the things which have caused the biggest advancement in life spans so the reason we live a lot longer is we're not dying of water being poor uh, quality and things like that generally speaking you don't just make populations live longer just because everybody's on pills you know you're just maintaining illness and in a large part of the time it's not making you any happier either yeah definitely man well i 100 percent agree with all of that um you know when i have a good friend his name's adam hart and uh, he does the power of food he wrote a book and we met a bunch of years ago in whistler and he was very very sick and uh he had to cure himself through food and as he began to research food he was about a year in depression um you know he wanted to go down the conspiracy road about just how you can't eat anything you know and how everything is trying to kill you and if you really look at it that's the truth you know that that is really the truth that the diet if you're eating mcdonald's pretty frequently and even when you go to the grocery store you might think you're eating healthy and you might be missing the mark massively and so coming back to a natural lifestyle it just makes sense it's it's natural whole foods um getting outside you know 
you 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 sit in the grass and now they call it earthing, um, which is ridiculous. It's just getting outside and getting some sun. That's right. Um, you know, it's so it's we, we kind of live in this ridiculous age. Um, and so I guess for you, in your point of view, what are the most important tips uh, for eating and being well, just being healthy in general? Just your best health tips. I saw in the notes that I sent over that you haven't been sick in 30 years, which I love. Um, I maybe in the last 10 years I've been sick two times, and both times was uh, because of alcohol. <laughs> but um, I was, I was just using that. Say, yeah, I was just going to say with anything the. The thing I think I guess the general tips for everything would be everything in moderation, if you wanted to have anything. Uh, but the other thing is having a varied diet and a regular diet. So, so this is quite an interesting thing I found in my research. So, there's a chapter in the book, and they sound both sound uh, like oxymorons, but actually, you know, what it means is if your diet is varied, which means you're eating different food groups and your diet is fairly constant. What it means is you're roughly eating the same thing every day, except say when you're traveling or something like that. Then actually what we know is your saturated fat intake makes no difference to your cholesterol levels. So there was actually an interesting chapter in the book um, on fat uh, metabolism. And it's actually, actually it's interesting because the chapter was called skinny guts and fat, I mean, fat, uh, skinny brains and fat guts, right? Because the funny thing is, it is true that the fatter your gut is, your brain starts to shrink. I mean, this is a total fact. It's a scientific fact. People know that the fatter your gut becomes, so you keep gaining weight around your tummy, all the metabolism gets diverted there, so your brain starts to shrink a bit more. So the fatter you are, the higher your risk of getting dementia and things like that. So, so, but however, what was interesting is, and then you look at the fats within your blood system, the whole thing was a, a crazy sort of how it even evolved into a scientific model. And actually, this is an interesting theory. You know, you may have heard of Thomas Kuhn, who wrote this Kuhn effect, which was talking about how advances get taken up by science or medicine. And often what it is, is they take a very long time because people form a little society for something and then it becomes like a club and then you only have to preach the same thing which everyone else is saying and then, and then you self-propagate it as opposed to because then it becomes a way of living right so what was interesting is what they found with fat is there was never really any science behind the fact that eating an egg was bad for you or eating it yes it is true that a certain people may have a genetic predisposition but by and large there was never any evidence that eating natural form butter was worse for you than eating a chemical like margarine, for example. So it made no sense that you chemically created something to look like butter and it could actually be better for you than actually eating the natural thing. But but that was what was propagated and that was what was immediately taken up by medicine and then behind it was so many cholesterol lowering medications and it became a massive thing. But what we found in research is there is actually no evidence provided your diet is varied and your diet is also roughly constant that your saturated fat intake actually makes a specific difference to your cholesterol level so to a large degree um, you it's about things in moderation it's about not being too excessive but it, it always comes down to i think like you said the natural form so even when we studied health foods everything which was sold to you as a supplement be it fish oil or whatever you're better off eating it in a natural form and it was better for you than in a chemical form. Because once you process something, the body rejects a significant portion of it because the body reacts to it as if it's a chemical. So I actually did a study, like you said, you know, I develop skincare and one of the things we looked at, I have a scanner which bounces light off your face and not only when you can see the sun damage now, but we can actually predict where your wrinkles are going to form in 20 years if you were interested. So, so what it does is when we were looking at it, we were looking at trying to create serums and things which reduce the effects of sun damage because I know everybody wants to look younger or things like that. Everyone's asking me, can you make something? But what I found interesting is we tried vitamin C serums and they do help and you try eating an orange and it does help. But you took a vitamin C pill and it didn't make any difference. So in the beginning, I thought maybe there's something wrong with my machine. But then I realized there's a thing which is well known and it's called xenobiotic metabolism. So the body rejects these artificial forms. So to a large degree, because it's not normal for you to consume vitamin C in that way or vitamin D in that way, 
So in actual fact, if you're taking a lot of supplements, but you're not eating those foods in the natural form, all you're creating is such expensive urine that you may as well bottle it and sell it, right? Because it actually just all gets excreted. So, so a large part is being natural and being authentic, and that includes in what you eat and your life. And because, you know, again, the same thing, we also know that being positive helps, having passion for something helps, learning new languages helps. So all these things, um, learning new languages helps parts of the brain we're reducing dementia. So a lot of things are, you know, the world is full of different people. So it's good to get to know others, learn new languages, be positive. And also like I've given a TED talk called The Myth of Race, you'll find interesting because all the skin color simply came about because people migrated different parts and ate different things. It was always a battle between vitamin D and folic acid. So really we're all the same human beings. Some may be taller or shorter. Again, we can explain that biologically why that is, but there's really nothing about, you know, superiority, inferiority, and the world is so increasingly divided. It's quite silly. Man, <clears throat> very interesting. Well, it's, uh, I'm just going to hear like the uh, listeners, you, you always want like this sexy answer that's just so easy you know like what are the best tips on health while well, you eat you know mango in the morning then you do 20 sit-ups and then you run around your tree for 10 minutes and then all of a sudden you have perfect health but like anything it's a, it's a lot simpler you know i think that we're conditioned to want this quick and easy answer when you know health is pretty simple um, if we can just, you know, understand what we eat and what we're putting into our bodies, which is a whole road for people usually, because again, we're not taught um, this type of thing. And um, I do want to touch on your opinion between, uh, and I think I know your answer, but I'm asking anyway, between a vegan diet, vegetarian diet, paleo diet, um, your thoughts on something like that. Um, but I was really curious about this, uh, because you're talking about genes um, earlier and how there's a gene for laziness and sluggishness and all these different things um, and about deep sleep. So me curious, I, I sleep super deep and sometimes I can procrastinate. Um, in your opinion, is this a gene thing or is this something that's conditioned or is somebody more likely to get it? Or what's your view on something that is like a, a personality trait? Yeah. So we know that procrastination is also linked to impulsivity. So the fact just looking at you now and then what we would say is, yes, you would be like, it's funny, it's because you've been testing so many people and you develop an intuition. So looking at you, I'd say you would be a bit of a procrastinator, but you'd also be impulsive. So, so basically, we know that proc procrastination and impulsivity are linked. Right. So, so, but, but here's the thing. It's actually an evolutionary adaptation because for example you see the thing to remember is everything is links back to our past so 100,000 years ago life was very dangerous so when people migrate or there were lots of predators and human footprint on the planet was very small see now we control the planet but at that time we didn't there were animals everywhere so a lot of human beings who were migrating walking out were killed by saber tooth tigers and things like that so here's what's interesting is the people who were anxious and the people who were procrastinators survived because you were still in the cave. So somebody like you would have been still in the cave saying, my spear is not sharp enough. The tiger's going to get me. I better sharpen it a bit more. But there may be some others who are like, oh my God, the tiger's going to get me. I'm too frightened. But guess what? You guys survived. So you propagated your genes. And, and this is one thing that's interesting. When you talk to a biologist or a medical person or a geneticist about fitness, and then you talk about the general public, there's a big difference. So when you talk about survival of the fittest, people think that meant the strongest one survived. No, fitness is defined. If you look at the definition of fitness dictionary in biology, it is the ability to propagate a gene. It may be a weak gene. So in this case, the procrastinators and the anxious survive, not because they're stronger, but because they just happen to survive. So they became fitter as a population, but we may not see that as physical fitness. But our, we've applied it in layman's terms to mean fitter and stronger as fitness but in biology it's all about what genes get propagated so sometimes it may be a bad gene and and you know so 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 the thing with that is these genes have an evolutionary adaptation so sometimes actually in people like you it's actually all of us can have a procrastination gene. some people are just more tuned to it so let's just say you were a procrastinator in some ways actually you also have a higher ability to really know inside that your plan isn't right. 
So what we now know is when we've done psychological tests in these people, it's actually quite finely tuned. So it's not actually necessarily a bad thing. You just need to know it and recognize it. So for example, if you're a procrastinator and you're delaying on something, if you really analyze the deep down inside, you would know, you would say, Matt, this plan isn't ready yet because I haven't really, you know, ticked these boxes, so let's get it. So one of the things, like I said, I teach um, children creativity and let's say you were writing a story or you were big, starting a business, whatever. And it's like, you know, selling when others talked about positivity, but what I do is I just define everything into the three C's, which is set the context, which is like in your case, you would say define your brand or what are you about? And the second thing is develop your own character, which is, you know, you do each, understand each of it to its fullest. So for example, you are a snowboarder. So if you said your brand is, you are as this champion snowboarder, the second thing would be, what is the character? You would know the ins and outs of every bit of snowboarding, you know about snowboard, blah, blah, blah. And then there'll be some conflicts. There'll be some things which come up, which won't make sense, you'd say, hang on, but this doesn't work with that, or I can improve a snowboard by using this material, whatever, and that's how you develop things. So I often say this, this helps science and math, and I ended up being an advisor on UNESCO because of this approach, because what I find is this, pro it helps you solve problems. And I've developed two surgical techniques, and it wasn't an improvement on previous ones, they were completely new because you were trying to solve a problem, not improve previous, knowledge. So the traditional way of learning is somebody gives you knowledge and then you only think within those parameters and you're thinking, okay, what else can I do here? Rather than that, if you look at, okay, what are we dealing with? What is the character of it? How am I going to, what needs improvement here? And so that's the same thing we've got to look at our bodies. You've got to say, you know, what is the context? It may simply be that you want to improve performance. You may think I'm just not productive enough or you may think I'm just need to lose weight. And then the second thing is you understand why is this happening? So look at everything and then we resolve the conflict. Interesting. Again, <laughs> not exactly at all what I expected, um, but, uh, but uh, an insightful answer. Um, Man, there's it's interesting because when when I was reached out to do the interview, I was looking at just the the sample questions that they gave, and there's just there's such a diverse uh, landscape that that we can go into. You know, like you, developing your own surgeries is that in itself is just ridiculously impressive. Um, but you know, my goal here was having someone like you with, with such an interesting mind. Um, you know, from your perspective, for for people that may be struggling with health issues, for me personally, it's it's always looking at what I can do to improve my performance. Um, you know, growing up a martial artist and an athlete, I want to see, you know, how do I max out strength, jumping, snowboarding, spinning, athleticism, focus, whatever that whatever that is. Um, do you have any kind of you know steps or processes or suggestions just to start on that track, whether it's you know analyzing your diet or look at how you interact with your environment, just with everything you've learned, what would you kind of give as um, I, just I, I processes think, or tips or tools? Yeah, I, I think the first thing is you always everything boils down to genes, which is your blueprint and the environment. So it can be anything. So if you look at, for example, even an illness, you look at Lung cancer, for example, you would say, are you smoking because that's an environmental factor? And then there is, so if you look at skin cancer, you will say, what's the environmental factor that is sunburns or high UV damage? And then you look at, so, so for everything. So that goes for your diet. So if you're looking at performance, then normally if you weren't doing a test, for example, and you were taking the cheapest approach with not spending anything, then I would say, well, write down a food uh, diary for like two weeks, everything you ate, even if it's, you didn't think it was significant and send it to me and I'll take a look because typically, like I said, we can identify certain foods which are lower energy foods for you. And and you see, it's like interesting when you said, for example, so for example, you, you mentioned mangoes earlier, so I'll bring it up. So if you look at mangoes, mango is a high fructose food, like sweeter fruits have fructose. So there have been studies done on like 23,000 plus people which showed that, you know, if you're eating the more colored vegetables you eat, the best they are for you. So for example, even if you're eating a potato, you eat the purple skinned one, 
that has a, as much polyphenols and antioxidants as broccoli and things. But if you eat the normal potato, then it's just starch. So, so the more colored the vegetable is it, but the more sweet a fruit is, the thing you've got to be aware of is that the fruit then have fructose, which is exactly like what is in a lot of artificial foods, um, what they call high fructose corn syrup in America, but a fruit sugar is like HFC 55, the middle of the range. So if your diet was all day mangoes, right? Let's just say, for example, then what you, it's even though you think it's natural, it's actually not good for you because it's just a fructose based diet, which means your sugar goes up quickly, comes down quickly, and then you don't have any energy left. So as opposed to things which are slow, and going to last through the day, like oats or almonds or things like that. And then if you said, what are the best antioxidants, then you would look at the foods which are highly colored, but which are high, very dense. So for example, you'd think four things which come to mind would be turmeric, uh, blueberries, broccoli, and these are sort of things I make skin serums out of. So, um, so what I mean is, so these sort of stuff, typically um, are ones which are high antioxidant foods. And here's the other funny thing is this, if you ever were to take a supplement, because I think if you don't need them, you can eat natural and get all the supplements. But if you were to take them, you need to take them when you're well, because if you take them when you're ill, you actually deteriorate. But that's again, counterintuitive. So let me give you an example. So somebody has got cancer, they're on chemo. One thing we do is we ban people from taking any vitamins or supplements while they're on treatment because they do worse. But that's not intuitive. So people may say to you, Matt, you're looking a bit run down, mate, so you better take some uh, vitamins, you see, but that's actually not the time to take it. If you want to take them, take them when you're well, and that's fine. The reason for it is because when you're ill, your body is actually fighting illness, so it's actually producing its natural antioxidants. And you taking something chemical suppresses it because it thinks, oh, I've already got some, so the body actually stops producing them. So, so yeah, the simplest level, I would say, you can just have a food diary first and then look at what you're doing. Do things like, you know, if you are one of those people who finds it difficult to concentrate, then meditation and things help. Now, here's what we looked at exercise. So if your particular thing is, say, avoiding dementia, for example, if you had a family history, then we looked at all different exercise forms. And when I was researching this book, I thought I'd be writing about Tai Chi and yoga and stuff. But the single biggest exercise form which reduced the risk of dementia was tango because it had movement, dance form, and things, so, you know, learning the tango, because it's more, not more rigid like, as a waltz from a step by step, you're just following the thing. And it was really funny when this book was launched to New York, and I mentioned the tango, and in the audience, there was Paul Pellicoro, who taught Al Pacino to dance the tango on scent of a woman. So he got excited, and he sprang up, and he said, I taught Al Pacino to dance the scent of a woman. So there's a picture of, I said, come on us and give us a lesson. So we ended up having a lesson from him as well as a book launch. <laughs> so, so I'd say, yeah, otherwise the second step, if you want to fine tune it, then you just order the test and then I'll send you a report and then we will make personal recommendations, which can tell you what exercises you should do, what foods you should eat. Of course, you don't need to be rigid about it in life. Nothing is so rigid and then you, but you get a good guide. Wow, man, interesting. Well, you've you've done my favorite thing uh, when I interview somebody on the podcast, where you make me realize and know that I don't know anything, and that I gotta like there's. But it's awesome because of all the work that you're doing. Uh, I am definitely going to do whatever that test is or, or whatever it is because um, there's so much out there, you know, um, on different things, right? Like I asked you before, is the paleo diet better than vegetarianism, better, better than oh, vegan? I, I didn't than... answer the question. I'll come to that. Oh, yeah. So, so the, okay, go for that. Yeah. So the paleo diet is actually a paleo fantasy. I can tell you that first. The reason for that, I say that in the book, it's a paleo fantasy. The, the reason is this, paleo man, there was a weed called purslane or pigweed, which used to, most of the earth was covered by a weed called purslane or pigweed, which is not there now. But that had very, very high omega-3. Right, now here's what's interesting is, our omega-6 to omega-3 oil ratios in our diets are totally out of kilter. So ancient man, they didn't have a lot of these sweet fruits and things, but they ate a lot of these weeds. And these weeds were very high in omega-3. So even if you were not eating a lot of fish and you were not near the water, you were getting a lot of omega-3. Now here's what's interesting. When people analyze, and you can do that by analyzing bone residues and things like that of ancient man, their 
ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 was 1 is to 1, like roughly the same amount. Today, we our ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 is something like 16 to 1. And we know that if you reduce it to 5 to 1, it reduces the risk of breast cancer. We bring it down to 3 to 1, it reduces as rheumatoid arthritis. Bring it down 2 to 1, it reduces the risk of cancer. So we actually know this now that having more omega-3 is very good for you. And that's why people talk about fish oils or the walnuts and flaxseed and everything else, because the more omega-6 we have, the better. So, so the first point is to answer paleo. It's a little bit of a fantasy because paleo men may have eaten meat. Again, it was not processed, but he had a lot of omega-3. Whereas the people who are now having the paleo diet are not having that because that wheat doesn't even exist. So they're trying to substitute with modern salads, which are not quite the same. So I think that's a fantasy. So that we can park it to a side. But now if you talk about vegetarianism and veganism, the vegetarianism is, a, is interesting because if you ask me from a planet point of view, then I, absolutely, because a significant part of not only our climate change and global warming, but also how we've used up our resources is because of big animal farming. So, so in some ways, absolutely right that if we all became vegetarian, the earth could probably take another billion people. Like, you know, people studies used to say the earth's capacity is 10 billion if we're all vegetarian and 9 billion if we eat meat. So in some ways, vegetarianism is probably, as a resources point of view, it's really good. The issue with um, veganism is interesting because um, some people can't anyway digest a lot of dairy and things which we pick up from our gene test and starch anyway. But the only other issue with vegetarianism is that some people may always have a genetic disposition to lack iron or and, and have need more omega-3. And so if you're not eating fish, you may find that. But if you defined vegetarianism as the French way of saying, well, fish is just, or like even in Bengal and India, the Bengali Brahmins, if you've ever been to India, the upper class Brahmins, they don't eat any, they're all vegetarian. But if you go to Bengal in India, they all eat fish, even the Brahmins. They say, well, that's just the flower of the sea. There's a word in Sanskrit for it, it's called Jala Pushpa, which means they're just flowers in the sea, right? So if you took that concept of it, probably the healthiest thing is not eating much meat, but having fish and eating a lot of vegetables, which are highly colored. But on the other hand, if you said what's greatest for the planet resources, then absolutely vegetarian is pretty good. Veganism is really more philosophical thing. If you said, I don't want to take any animal products and it's different, but from a health point of view, in fact, I think dairy is neither here nor there. In fact, I, I don't have a lot of dairy simply because I know that I'm a little bit lactose intolerant. And typically people who've had dissent in Asia, significant proportion of them will be a bit lactose intolerant. So you will find that you're actually better off for not having much dairy anyway. So, but having said that, you know, we once a year, it's funny, my daughter and I, we do a veganuary. So every January we go vegan just for a month to see if we can do it. And so I, I do know I've tried out for a month, but it's quite hard only because if you try to go out and eat anywhere and, you know, she's like a vegan Nazi, if you go to this restaurant and she's like, have there, have you cooking this with butter? And they're like, yes, I feel like we can't have this. So every time we were traveling at the time and we found that our options were getting like smaller and smaller. So I think vegan is more difficult for you to manage in society. But I think, you know, vegetarian, you can get by. But if you don't have a predisposition to getting low omega-3 and low iron, you're probably all right. Awesome. Amazing, man. Another spectacular answer. Kind of sorted out some things for me because, uh, you know, I've I've gone back and forth. I was a vegetarian for about three years. Um, and even before that, I ate, you know, when I transitioned, it was about a year, about 10% meat. Um, I've recently reintroduced a little bit of meat into my diet and eating meat more regularly than I have in four years. Um, but I kind of play with that. And, and the main one is really just what it does to the planet. But also, I can't kill anything, you know, like, I'm going to make best friends with the pig, and I'm going to make friends with the cow. And, and so the the ethical side of it, you know, my reasoning yeah. is something that I want to go into at this point in time. Um, but I want to be respectful of your time because uh, we're coming up on an hour and I know that you are an official doctor. You have a lot of things to do. Um, but there is one thing that I want to ask before you go and then make sure. Um, so feel free to elaborate as, as much or as little as you'd like um, and make sure people 
can know where they can take this test, where they can get a hold of you and all that kind of fun stuff. But the question is around mental illness, because I know that this is something that is more prevalent and it's actually um, in my life as well. Um, you know, I know of people with uh, bipolar and, uh, you know, going through that whole process with somebody that you love and losing the mind uh, is a very scary thing. And uh, I think it's pretty common nowadays, mental illness and maybe even extreme depression um, and other things. So I was just curious if any of your work um, leads into that and, and things that we can do for understanding that and, and getting proper treatment and, and care. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is a big chapter in the book on that. And um, so the book is just the genetics of health. And you can, even if you just did the genetics of health.com, you'll find the book as well as the gene test. But really what we know is that like diet does play a big part, like in eating chemical driven foods does play a big part in mental illness. The other thing we also know is stress and anxiety, like we know have a genetic basis like we just said earlier but if you were one of those scary cats and you've got the stress genes then it's important to do things like meditation and mindfulness because it's it's about knowing your body because and that helps you cope with it and then you overcome it because otherwise you're constantly it's stress is actually very useful in short bursts it's like a fire alarm but if you you can use stress like a drug you can use it to power you but you can't be under chronic stress because of the second level of stress is the steroid production, everything else, and then you start suppressing your immune system. So I think the first thing would be, the other thing we also know are things like, you know, the more loving you, and this one thing I say is, you know, we, this is part of, this is not only loving our environment, loving ourselves, our bodies, by knowing what it is and loving other people, because the more positive you are and the more helpful you are, what you actually find is the more healthier you are as well. So there was actually studies there was actually a specific study done on the implications of health and generosity. And what they found is people who were more generous actually had better health. So you look at a lot of the guys whom you think have made a lot of money, but they're not necessarily the most generous. They actually don't necessarily, not only they may not have good physical health, but also they may not have good mental health. So, and, and the real message here is, you know, Matt, how will we think about it? There are only three types of people, either where, Western, Judeo, Christian, Islam, if we believe in heaven or hell and of some form over Eastern, you know, Hindu, Buddhist, or believe they're reincarnated or you're green atheist, you get recycled by earthworms. But in all these three, the only commonality is we only live once in this form. And like you said, you know, you may come back as something else or nothing, but this is our only chance to make a difference. And I think a big part of this is loving that opportunity and with part of it is, so So when you specifically mentioned bipolar, for example, we know that infants who were nurtured by uh, the mother, for example, have a higher risk of bipolar illness later on. So we know a lot of these predispositions, but we also know which diets make it worse for them. So for example, we don't want swings in serotonin levels. So of course, for somebody who has a tendency to get that the worst kind of foods are the fast foods with their high swinging serotonin levels. So, so that kind of stuff. So once you know what you are, then you can also plan to how you can manage your life around. It. And then, you know, when you need help, obviously medicine can help, but fundamentally um, medicine should be, it's like law and justice. You only need it when you're in trouble. Most of the time you should be able to take care of yourself. Beautiful, brother. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, sharing all your wisdom. Thank you for your book. And uh, I'm definitely going to reach out and get that test done because I'm very curious for myself. Um, I'll notice sometimes I eat where I become more tired and I don't know why. And I see other friends with more energy, but I'm, you know, I'm really in shape. I'm fit. I think I eat well. So. A simple thing like some people have starch indigestion and things like that. Like the only difference is another piece of useless information for you. The only difference between wolf and a dog because i tell you what my dog ate a i managed to put him out because otherwise he'd bark when i was talking to you and what happened is he ate a bit of my manuscript so i said because you ate a paper i'm going to swab you and then uh, because i work with animals we swabbed a wolf and guess what the only difference between a dog and a wolf as i found out is a wolf cannot digest starch whereas a dog can because a dog moved in with humans and he's not only your friend in need but also your friend in feed and so they can eat Starch, because wolves can't. 
So, so if you are like a wolf man, for example, and then you can, uh, genetically speaking, then you couldn't digest starch. So if you're eating a starchy meal, you will find that you become slower and less energetic and have problems. So it could be a simple thing like meal of potatoes is doing that to you because you are actually inside your mat, the wolf. You know, it could be. We'll find out. Interesting. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, uh, so where can people get a hold of you? Is that Gene? What, what's the website? It's just, you can just do my name, SharadPaul.com. And that has all the other links to it, or the name of the book is Genetics of Health. You can just do geneticsofhealth.com as well. It comes to the same site, and you can order the book there. You can order the gene test there, or you can just get in touch. Awesome. Thank you, brother. Well, do you have any closing messages, anything you'd like to leave the listeners with? I think the main thing is, you know, this is your life, so you have to take charge of it and, you know, um, be natural, be happy, be giving. And I really think... Ultimately, it's not about, you know, at the end of life, it's not about the things we take, but it's the things we leave behind. And I really think that's a message in medicine when you're dealing with cancers and everything else. I've never found anybody at the end of life wish that they had more money or they had married another woman or they had amassed more wealth. It's always been I didn't have enough time with a particular friend or family or didn't give enough. So I just think at the end of the day, we only live once. So at the end of time, it's about what we can leave behind and that includes a better planet. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you so much, brother. Thank you for coming Take on. Care, thank you for your book yourself. and all your work. Yeah, thanks for, you know, doing all the stuff with, uh, you know, you're an awesome person, man. Just I thank recognize you. Thank you. you. I appreciate you. you. you as well. Thank you, brother. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll take care. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Catch you in the next one. Peace. See you